Hi everyone, this is the Kundalini Collective podcast. It's our first interview. Alan, Fouts and myself, Samir Patel, are interviewing a number of people who have some experience in the spiritual awakening Kundalini process. Uh, our first guest today is Anne Mathy. And the reason we chose Anne is we've heard her talk before about Kundalini experience and we thought she was quite amazing and interesting and articulate in her description of the process. So we invited her to be our first interviewee. Um, so Anne, would you mind Hello. telling us uh, a little bit about yourself to begin with and your relationship with Kundalini and spiritual awakening? Okay, great. Yeah. Hello. Thanks for having me today. Um, so it's been quite a long journey in my life and quite a, a personal one, I would say, in that um, from a young age, my dad would tell me about his experiences with Kundalini. He had a, a spontaneous awakening in his 20s. Uh, he's Scottish. Uh, he went to Tokyo in the 60s, training in martial arts and meditating a bit here and there and, and had this spontaneous experience. And it was quite, um, quite a profound, quite an extreme experience. And he would describe this to me when I was quite young. And I remember the age of five being completely blown away by some of his stories of um, visions or ecstasy or spontaneous mantra, things like this. And I remember just from such an early age thinking, wow, this is extraordinary. This is what I want to unpack and study. Um, so I was introduced to these kinds of phenomena through his um, anecdotal experiences through he was very he he contextualized his experiences through Buddhism, through the Theosophical Society, through um, Vedanta. So I remember seeing books on um, Vedanta as a young child, like looking at pictures. And then later on in my 20s, I had a similar experience. I think I think we both went through a very different psychological process with the whole thing and in reflection I think maybe this is largely because of um, our framing of the phenomena our the information that we already had my dad had no idea what was going on whereas when I went through it he he'd already explained quite a bit so my mission, I suppose, has been to incorporate this experience into our Western psychology to create a framework for it. We often see these experiences as a kind of mania, uh, schizophrenia, a psychosis. Some of the phenomena that occur during a Kundalini experience can be seen as such. So, um, yeah, I want to find models or frameworks that can support this experience and channel it to its full potential and the only place I have experienced I, I don't know much about western philosophy or concepts around this topic but I know that they exist but for me the Indian philosophy was outstanding in the way that it framed this phenomenon so I studied a lot of Indian philosophy um, Buddhism, Tantra, Yoga to uh, give a more give more depth into the metaphysics into the psychology into the subtle body experiences that happen with kundalini so that's where i'm at now i'm kind of studying as a scholar and as a practitioner i err towards a buddhist framework i'm curious actually when you, when you, when you say the buddhist framework I'm, I'm actually curious how that um varies from the um no, the traditional indian f framework which i guess is sort of more of a hindu based yeah yeah it's that i mean that's a, a really good question because a lot of them merge i mean at the end of the day we're talking about uh, a human experience but a uh steering of this i suppose you could say human potential and as many people may have experienced the the kundalini phenomena it it, it happens within the psyche within one's own experience now this uh, from what I have gathered from talking to people and in interviews with people who've gone through the Kundalini experience, it seems that um, it comes from the inside out. Uh, 
it's a natural phenomena. It's something that emerges from deep within the psyche and it rises to the surface of the consciousness. And these are quite profound experiences within the emerging of this like subconscious urge or, or force. Um, there are really profound experiences which are really common, like as if frameworks exist within our subtle consciousness common to everyone common within our biology or our dna everyone seems to have similar experiences so within the indian traditions it seems as though there's an evolution of um understanding what these frameworks are so you go back to the vedic times and it's it all seems to surround trying to understand the nature of reality what's the warp and weft of this the structure of our universe um through insight, through direct experience. And, and a lot of that within the Indian traditions surrounded this idea of bliss or nectar experienced through the body. And that is certainly what lots of people seem to experience with the Kundalini experience is this, this uh, flood of nectar, this flood of bliss through the body. At the same time, having profound insight into the nature of reality. And so throughout these traditions, you see um, similar threads uh, coming up you see similar concepts arising similar um, theories explaining similar phenomena so the theories might be a different way of explaining something which is a shared experience so in terms of buddhism for me i found buddhism contained the kundalini experience and then it went beyond it so i know lots of yoga traditions the kundalini experience is a kind of um, the goal. Whereas in a lot of, I mean, in a few, obviously, there are so many different yoga practices, yoga philosophies, yoga traditions. But for me, the Buddhist ideology took the kundalini phenomena and then transcended it in a means that was manageable, in a means that was creating a psychology completely free of suffering. Can I just jump in? Um, yeah. I, my limited knowledge of Buddhist Tantra extends probably to the Kala Chakra system. Mm -hmm. When I had my Kundalini experience uh, with no background in Buddhism, I felt fairly drawn to this Buddhist Tantric system called Kala Chakra. Uh, in fact, I felt, I felt very drawn to it. So as soon as I had the experience, I some stumbled across it and connected to it completely. It wasn't until about 12 years later that I attended the Kala Chakra initiation ceremony. And um, it turns out that the mandala in Kala Chakra three-dimensionally represents the body. And um, they have a, a word called candela, and it starts in the stomach and it rises through your body. Mm -hmm. And the mandala represents parts of your body. So as, as it moves through your body, it enters different parts of the three-dimensional structure of the temple. Um, so what I discovered was that I was quite attracted to a system that already had a, uh, a, a similar idea of Kundalini, but it was Buddhist in nature. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. um, I have seen that Buddhism tends to slightly, it has a similar system. It's slightly different, or at least what I've seen is slightly different. But... Um, it does seem to have a different uh, quality and almost a different, um, what's the word, a different emphasis rather than the Hindu, mm -hmm. uh, which seems the Hindu uh, yogic system seems to be about guru and initiate attaining enlightenment or, or a kind of divinity, whereas there's something slightly different about the Buddhist tantric journey using Kundalini. I don't know whether you agree or not. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, there's so many different flavors with all of these traditions and a lot of them, I, I think, from what I've seen, is that a lot of these traditions will pick up on the tradition of the area to assimilate. So the way Buddhism or the way Tantra has spread throughout India over time, someone would go to a place and bring the knowledge and it would take a process of assimilation into that area. So they would have to adopt certain traditions of the land in order to then bring forward Buddhist ideologies. So, for instance, in Tibet, you would have a lot of bomb tradition mixed in with 
a lot of uh, Buddhist culture, Buddhist ideas. You've also got like in between Buddhism and the development of Vajrayana, you had Tantra, which was a separate thing, which was not Buddhist, although they shared some same ideas. Now, Tantra is so interesting in regards to Kundalini because Tantra seems to really get into the strange phenomena that happen with Kundalini. Tantra seems to explore that more than Buddhism. So from my understanding of early Buddhism, they don't really talk about those bizarre experiences like Kriyas that happen or like you were describing these. um, We were chatting the other day, Samir, and you were describing this experience of um becoming the deity and ex- becoming the mandala tantra really goes into that tantra really goes into this um some of the phenomena like um people experience spontaneous mudras happening and that is in tantra they would describe that like um forces of the universe so shakti would be kind of broken down into various forces like each shakti is 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 ultimate desire ultimate compulsion the compulsion of the universe and it speaks through the body so when kundalini happens it's like you're entering into a sacred space and this language of the universe comes through the fingers comes through your body to express this language so this these mudras are like a language and with them come an attitude like a by um, a bhavana an experience and this experience is sort of personified like a deity uh and it has an expression which like what you were describing represents the whole mandala which represents aspects or forces within our universe and this is what is experienced in the Kundalini experience to its full fruition. I think lots of people have partial uh, experiences like uh, Kriyas happen or jerky head movements. But I think when the blockages are cleared, uh, this full dance happens with different bhavana coming out or, or expressed through the body. So this is Shakti expressing herself through the body in, in all of its various forms, which is really interesting, really strange and really bizarre. And there is nowhere in our current Western psychological paradigm which allows for this. But what it does, it sort of expands one's mind beyond a selfhood so that we can see more layers to our existence. So, so Buddhist, so Tantra, <laughs> to, to kind of summarize that, Tantra really does get into the nitty gritty of all of those wonderful, bizarre phenomena that arise with Kundalini. So Vajrayana Buddhism took the meditation practices of early Buddhism that the Buddha taught and merged them with tantric experiences, tantric practices in India the two were separate initially and Vajrayana brought them together um, weaved them together the yogic praxis the yoga the um, the kriya the concepts of shakti and deity and merged them with buddhist non-duality so that's later on you get the color chakra it's like an evolution I suppose of these ideas as you say, it's an evolution. Just to get some um, idea, what, what's a time scale? What, 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 no, in history, what's a, what's a time? Times are you talking about? Good question. Well, uh, I mean, as far as we know, there's, I mean, there's debate. It goes back even further to a civilization pre Veda, um, but I don't. I can't really speak in detail on that because I don't. Uh, I don't know how much evidence there really is to go into depth about that. They think it was maybe a kind of. Um, um pe- uh, pagan type practice pre-veda so but some of the deities crossed over into vedic times but early vedas was all about the the sacred priest the poet who was able to dispel fear so anyone who could speak profound knowledge and remove fear or hate or judgment or prejudice they were considered the communicator of god and so it was the language of the poet who was able to bring the community together and remove fear so that kind of is where the that's the rig Rig veda and then that evolved into that poet that eloquent articulate priest poet 
that evolved into the priest where they started to break it down into ritual, really a real science of ritual. We talk about 2000 BC. Like Two, yes, sorry, you want to date? All uh, right. Well, no, no, it's <laughs> yeah, yeah. Relevant, but some uh, About yeah, about 1500 BC. So yeah, yeah, around 1500 BC. So it was only until, um, gosh, dates. It was only until I the, the Chan. So sixth to 8th century you have the Chandogya Upanishads and that's when you've got the the Aranyaka movement that's when you've got people leaving the Vedic fire people leaving their communities to go and meditate so it was less about spirituality being in um, the community with the poet and the priest and then it became about self-exploration it was like this divide almost behind social duty and then spiritual liberation. So people went to the forest to go and meditate. It's around the sixth century. That's where you get the Upanishads, this whole system of knowledge, which is really where we see the first notion of Kundalini, which we, you see the concept of the central channel and the thread um, through the central channel and this experience of, of bliss and ecstasy through meditation, through meditative practices. So that's... Um, So that's where you get this divide. And that's always been this interplay between societal duty and kind of lone meditation practice in India. So a lot of the traditions play between these two concepts or move between these two ideas. And I suppose that's that's the similar what I've found. That is the similar kind of psychological process people seem to go through when they have a Kundalini experience, the social duty. and the desire for God. Those two are often at odds to live in society and then to find God. God, I mean that in a uh, broad sense. You mean truth? You? Truth, yeah. 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 Uh, before we go any further, can we um, define some of the words you used earlier on? So three yeah. The words I want you to define in your own way. First is tantra. So if mm-hmm. people who are listening to this who are new, what exactly is Tantra? Yeah, there's lots of definitions. Um, tantra, again, is an is a, a evolution um, of ideas. It has many different forms and it took many different forms in society. Tantra is a technology a system of technologies that allow the individual to dissolve into oneness. Um, It also means um, weave, to weave. And those two things um, are synonymous in terms of the Sanskrit when you break it down. Those two things do mean separate things, but they're also synonymous in that the whole practice is weaving, um, it is to experience how interconnected and how woven we are into the bigger picture so tantra would be an exploration of all of those subtle levels subtle layers to our psyche and our bodies until we reach this transcendental state this emergence with everything with all phenomena so tantra it has taken different forms and there's all kinds of tantra that exists so very early tantra was very much about um uh quite some the there's two paths the left hand path would be quite profound or maybe um how would you say extreme practices which a householder wouldn't partake in because it was just too weird like meditating with corpses in a graveyard for instance and that was very extreme there's very good reason for that it's not morbid we can maybe unpack that later but it, it evolved um a, a scholar Um, practitioner Abhinava Gupta for instance he took those practices and brought them into the mainstream so but the whole purpose the whole purpose was to transcend mundane reality to um, unhook ourselves from our normal everyday attachments so we could experience liberation in the body liberation being freedom from your own um, worries hang-ups psychological processes that keep us trapped um, thank you. Uh, I've got a question actually linked to that. 
before I ask you for another definition, if Tantra is this weaving, as you describe, what is, why would the first, or why would Kundalini be linked? Now, maybe to, to myself and yourself, it's obvious, but could you articulate yeah. what is the link? Why would Kundalini be part of the Tantric path? Yeah, yeah, gosh. I mean, Kundalini, the word Kundalini comes about much later in the Tantric path. It doesn't mer- it, it emerge very early on. It kind of evolves. So it, it's Kundalini is a, a, you see an evolution of these concepts. So tan- Tantra is a philosophy in and of itself, but you've also got, it, 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 it is influenced by surrounding philosophies and schools of thought. So Tantra is influenced by the Upanishads, uh, which is Vedanta. Um, and of course, Tantra will have influenced yoga systems. So they all do merge together. So this concept of Kundalini, um, in terms of weave, this is such a loaded question because it does, it, it, in so many ways, it, it can be, this can be answered in so many ways. One way from what we know now, maybe looking back, collecting all of the information over the past 2000 years it's a mechanism it, it's a biological mechanism it's a psychological mechanism and it's a subtle body spiritual mechanism which untangles a force which untangles the compactness of the human so its power its explosion in the body its release will loosen the knots in our system to allow the threads or the the bundle that we normally are, the tight bundle that we normally are to reach out and connect with everything else. Um, Maybe that would be one way of describing it. And interestingly, in the yoga and the tantra, there's a really concise way in which it does this, the way it unfolds, the way it uh, cleanses the system, purifies thought forms from the body, thoughts that are stuck and lodged in our system that keep us behaving in in, uh, ways which trap us um okay thanks uh okay before i carry on there are two other words that you mentioned which is one want to unpacking the first is vajrayana this is mm-hmm. the buddhist term you mentioned am i pronouncing it correctly yeah i think so i mean don't ask me for my pronunciation is is awful so i'm i'm having it i'm i am studying sanskrit but i'm not <laughs> not that great at it so yeah my my pronunciation is not that good either for the viewers, just in case. <laughs> yeah. Uh, sorry. Yes. Uh, Vajrayana. Yeah. Yeah. So, so could you, could you define what is that to somebody who doesn't know? Uh, it, it's, it's, it would be Tibetan Buddhism. Um, so um, I think Tibetan Buddhism rose and fell a couple of times in Tibet. Um, it's, it's history is, is political it's cultural it's it's mixed in with a lot of different buddhism has gone through quite um quite a process in india the way that that wars have eradicated buddhism and then it's propped up again certain people have held on to it and it's flourished in other places in tibet um its history comes from a character called padmasambhava who brought tantric and buddhist texts to um tibet and taught uh the sacred teachings from uh texts he was also a siddha yogi so he had powers abilities he was able to the story goes he was able to communicate with the local deities when buddhism tried to flourish there before the the local spirits wouldn't let it so he had a way of appeasing the local spirits. Now this goes in, this ties into the tradition that was already in Tibet, which was Bom, which is about appeasing the local deities, a kind of quite shamanic almost tradition. So Padmasambhava was able to merge with this tradition quite well, the, the metaphysics of Tantra and Buddhism and include the local spirits and the deities and appease the local spirits and the deities to bring Buddhism in. So it was a merging of its core teachings, Hinayana, are the old Buddhist teachings from the Buddha himself. It's very practical. It's very much, this is how you meditate. This is what you want to see. And this is what causes liberation, absolute freedom from suffering. So they're the core teachings, the, Hina, the, 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 the original Dharma. The Mahayana is like 
this is what Vajrayana is. It's about not getting liberation for yourself. It's about doing it for the sake of others. So all of these traditions come from that concept. So it's all about incorporating all the tantric stuff, the deities, um, using the deities uh, through worship as a means of liberation. So that would be, so it's quite different from early Buddhism, Theravada, in that sense. Okay, and, and thank you. The last word is bhavna. You used the word bhavna earlier on. What is a bhavna? Bhavna is like, um, you know, when you feel, have you ever felt, I mean, this is another strong feeling that would come up. Have you ever felt like a devotion, like a sense of spiritual devotion? Um, like, maybe. Like a... <laughs> And it doesn't have to be to any particular God or deity or religion, just a feeling that arises in the heart, like a, a, like a love and longing and um, yearning, yeah, or, but it's, it's palpable. For, for, again, for, a yearning for what? For... Um, I wouldn't say it's a yearning for liberation, a yearning to be with God. Like to be so in love that it's painful to be away from that thing you love. Mm. That would be an example of a kind of bhavana. It's like an attitude that wells up in the body. So these are things. And I think that's, yeah, I, I, you know, in terms of the Kundalini experience, I mean, for me, that was a big bhavana that motivated everything. It all came from that, for me. What, the desire to learn more about, to connect more Kundalini? Um, yeah. Oh, yeah, the, 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 that, I feel that um, that feeling arose first and then the experiences happened after. Um. Can we talk a bit about your experience and uh, when you first had your initial awakening experience or series of experiences, can you tell a little bit, a little bit about what happened and where it came from and how you felt about it and what you did? Yeah, gosh. All right. Oh, well, I, I just finished university. I just been doing a sociology degree. So that was really interesting in that I was studying the structures within society, structures of power, and fundamentally how illusory it all was. These were constructs. So that was the kind of a lot of the main themes within the degree I was studying. So this was um, quite interesting and profound. This had gave me a profound realization in that this is all made up, you know, <laughs> and it's just layers and layers of concepts built on top of each other. And this is what we call reality. So when I left university, I felt this incredible freedom from institution. And that in, in itself was just amazing. I remember at graduation, one of the one of the people who was on my course was like, oh, I don't know what to do now. Like, this is it. And I remember just feeling like, oh, my God, are you kidding? This is amazing. So there was already this feeling of freedom welling up, like strong freedom and a desire to go and um let loose you know and see what was out there in the world after being in educate you know from school and then to university like parents school university all of that so I, I I got rid of everything like my flat boyfriend friends everything and just went hitchhiking and and that was born from this joy to want to explore and at the same time that feeling of devotion like I described earlier started to arise in me um the time I was living in London and I felt like the people I was like, oh, they're, they were beautiful, beautiful people. But I knew that if I was to start talking about the whole spiritual stuff, they would take the mick out of me. So I, I wanted to go and connect with people who were maybe feeling the same thing, that sense of devotion. Um, it's not a common feeling for a, for a 20 year old in London. I don't, you know, in, in a in certain scenes I guess I don't know maybe it is now I think it's probably changed a, a lot but um yeah so I I, I uh I think that giant leap of faith 
out into the unknown allowed me to go and meet people uh, who were able to awaken certain parts of that or connect with certain parts of that. And it was through I think a Shakti Pat is what it's called that initiated the whole process. Would you mind telling us a bit about that actual experience, the Shakti Pat experience? Like where did you seek it or was it accidental? And oh no, yeah. I mean, I wasn't seeking anything at all other than to like that, just being alive was great. Um, yeah, I wasn't on a spiritual quest or anything like that. I was just having a nice time. Um, and someone I met was able to. So at the time, I'll speak to you about it from the position of how I felt at the time. And then I'll unpack it as I see it now in terms of after what I've studied about what a Shakti Pat is. Um, at the time, this person came to me. I was very naive, very young, very um, innocent to all of this. I had no real knowledge or study or experience at all, which was probably made me more ripe <laughs> for plucking. Um, and this person was able to look in, well, this is the experience of what it felt like, look through my eyes, into my eyes, deeply into my eyes to the point where it kind of mesmerized me. My experience was that he was able to read my thoughts and I was able to read his. And he was explaining um, how to position my mind in a space of no thought or describing that. And then the minute my mind kind of tipped over into no thought, it was like a fountain of white light burst out of my forehead. Everything else disappeared. And it was from that point that the whole thing started to unravel. So that was the first, that was the first time I was like, whoa, there's, this is wild. Like nothing like that had happened before. So it was from that point that the whole process, which is a, seems to have been a process of energetic experiences. And you said, Sorry. And what tradition was he from, just out of curiosity? No, none. Oh, he right. wasn't, yeah, no, there was no tradition involved in any of this. This was just, it did, I, there was no label attached to it. There was no words, that, uh, there was no pay money for it. This happened, this happened at a, uh, a gathering at sunrise over a quarry. Like it, it was natural, organic, beautiful. There was no um, satsang or sangha, or there's nothing like that. It's just, some interesting person <laughs> who had some contact with something bigger. Um, actually, we should actually define the word Shakti Pat. Mm. What is a Shakti Pat? So after studying, um, yeah, it seems though it seems as though it's a means to awaken Kundalini in someone else, a, a means to um, reach into someone and spark that original lifeline and allow that to move and flourish within the other person. And it seems that people who can do this have a very strong contact with a non-dual state. They are able to access this non-dual state, which is a state of no mind, a state which transcends um, normal human psychology and that you aren't going through any normal thinking processes. Did, did the person who initiated you through Shakti Pat know he was doing Shakti Pat? Was I it a word that no. you... <laughs> I don't know. I, I never had the balls to ask. I was so, I mean, at the time, I was so enamoured by this person, so in awe, I felt it would be rude. <laughs> I, I, I was, yeah, at the time, of course, now I'd be like, hmm, now, so what, you know, but at the time, I just felt extremely humbled, um, went completely dumbfounded whenever I was in the presence of this person. I thought that they were... I'm sure they're just a normal person as well, you know. Um, but, yeah, at the time I didn't. And, yeah, I didn't ask. I don't know. I think from having seen this person a few times or I, I think this is what they do. 
secretly <laughs> they go about waking people up <laughs> but definitely certainly not at a paid satsang satsang or you know a gathering or a, no nothing like that do you see a, a like a almost an inevitable path in in your journey like going from when you're very young and with your, your dad having kundalini and then i uh, I too did a sociology degree mm. and it I had it, similar effect to me, to be honest, in the sense that I, I could really see the self was a construct. Mm. And um, I, I actually went to a series of um, lectures given by a Tibetan Lama. This was in Dharamsala. And I found the sociological concepts actually matched very well um, you know, with the, with the Buddhist concepts um so I, but what my thought is it's almost like there's there's a path there's a whether you're conscious of it or not there was sort of mm -hmm. a path going to where, where where you've where you've um come to which was set from a very early age do, do you think is, a, is a, there a sense that you've been on an, an almost a a path that perhaps you haven't that's not been um consciously um thought through perhaps but it has been a natural natural progression yeah I suppose we all we are all um, molded by our most profound experiences they are important in that they shape a lot of the architecture of our brains um, those ones that have impact good or bad so I mean for sure definitely but that that yeah, I mean, that's, it's a really, it's an interesting question because, um, because I think with this experience, it's, it's, it's easy for the mind to get caught up in these peak experiences and identify yourself with them. Um, and I believe it's important to position them appropriately. I, I mean, I, in terms of, I, I, yeah, I suppose I do, in answer to your question, I do feel that this is, there was only, this is the thing that wakes me up. This is the thing that enlivens me. This topic is the thing that I have endless energy to talk about more than anything else. So it seems only natural that I should pursue anything to do with this topic. Um but yeah, in terms of the way it, I, I see it, I think it's um, important to position these experiences um, appropriately so we don't get caught up in them. So, so just to be clear about what you're saying, and I think uh, all of us agree with this, you're saying that, that the Kundalini journey uh, presents us with experiences. These experiences can be articulated as paranormal or uh, uh, enlightenment or blissful experiences. However, uh, it's better not to, not to associate ourselves too much with these experiences or take these experiences as indications that we are enlightened beings. It's more about just experiencing and letting go. Yeah, I, I think so. I think that's healthier because at the end of the day, we have to integrate these experiences into our day-to-day -day lives into our uh, social groups, into our friendship groups, into our families. And um, uh, I, I think it's maybe unhealthy psychologically to associate too much with them in case they should provoke delusions of grandeur or um, a sense of greater than, although we all greater, are greater than a self, it's positioning that appropriately um in a way that is you know we're humble and we are i don't know i, I guess i like to see it as as we were just another soldier on the path you know we're, we're all just we're all equal there's no um it can consume you i think these experiences can completely consume your life you know and then nothing else matters anymore um in the Buddhist tradition, in the early Buddhist tradition, there's a thing called um, the Ten Impurities of Insight. 
so when you meditate especially within the insight tradition that's the vipassana that's when you scan the body the sensei ex- you examine the sensei experiences you do it's very common many many people who are dedicated to their meditation practice get sensations of bliss ecstasy kundalini you know and th- this this is very is very common and and they're warned to be aware of the 10 impurities of insight. So this would be delusions of grandeur. This would be to think that you're enlightened. This would be to think that uh, any kind of holiness, even though there's light pouring out of your body, (laughs) you know, even though these things which would make one think, oh, I'm enlightened, you know, that that could be happening. But then it, it, according to Buddhism, then you're missing the point. You're missing, um, missing, opportunity to examine the fact that nothing exists that this is just an impermanent uh process um oh sorry go ahead well i just say i think i think what you're saying is because if you if you did um identify with with it in a way of thinking you're special then all you're doing is actually creating another self rather than allowing the self to dissolve which is this, that's sort of how I see, see the yeah I, I agree I think that's a really great way of putting it yeah yeah another self absolutely so um looking at the Buddhist model as opposed to the Hindu model and I guess this is the question I've been asking myself uh would you say that there's a more of a focus uh I'm not sure whether this is true but would you say there's more of a focus on on the dissolution of self within the Buddhist model or something a bit more, how should I word this correctly, um, selfless, or are they both about dissolving the self completely? I think, I think they are both about dissolving the self completely. I think, um, yeah, they, 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 they are. Maybe there's different metaphysics, like a different view of the nature of the universe and how these forces interact with each other in order to make that happen. Um, I I haven't studied Vedanta in depth, but I understand it is about um, Brahma becoming or or, or dissolving the self to the point where you are. um, This is where it starts to get into the metaphysics of all these different traditions. Like in Buddhism, there's no soul. In Vedanta, there's a soul, and you would just be purifying the human parts of yourself to just experience this pure soul in Vedanta, whereas in Buddhism, you're just dissolving every part of the being into into nothing, into just arising and passing away particles of of existence. Is there no concept of unitary consciousness in Buddhism? Yes, yeah, a, a, a stream of consciousness would pass from one life to another in Buddhism, um, but that's not a soul. It would just be the conditions of consciousness. So, like, uh, let's say uh, you have a um, natural propensity towards, um, I don't know, car mechanics. That that's that those thought forms will arise in your life, and they will imprint in your brain. When you die, your body will decay, but those thought forms will still arise from your thought continuum, from your thought continuum, which will move into another body. It will be those desires which pull you into another body, physical body, and those thought forms will arise again. So the conditions we create to for certain thoughts, we create the conditions and then certain thoughts arise. Um, you put yourself in a loving environment loving thoughts will arise you put yourself in a harsh environment those harsh thoughts will arise so so i suppose that in buddhism they're trying to create the perfect conditions to support samadhi so hopefully in your next life you'll be born into a situation where samadhi will be easy for you because you'll have a peaceful family a peaceful life so given this context that you're talking about what's the purpose of kundalini uh, Kundalini in this context. So in the, in this context, there's there's they would in the early Buddhists they would describe 
what's called 16 stages of insight. Now, this is when you're quite good at meditating. This is when you're right into the constructs of your of the nature of reality. It's when you're examining the, the, the quantum level of existence in meditation through Vipassana. And then you go through, you, you experience different insights. You see the nature of reality in, in different angles. Kundalini happens at the fourth stage, the arising and passing stage. So all the light, the chakras, the nadis, the, all the subtle body, everything glows like a Christmas tree. All of these Kundalini experiences happen at the fourth stage. So that's when you start to experience the arising and passing away. Um, the purpose, I don't know. I haven't really read any scripture on this, but I've heard comments and it seems as though from experience, the Kundalini process is like hardcore drain cleaner through the system, <laughs> just to purify the subtle system and much could be the said the same for jhana which is a buddhist type of samadhi practice and the people who are i have heard talk about this who are experienced jhana practitioners they say it's the same energy as kundalini energy i'm assuming they've experienced kundalini energy and they are able to experience jhana to make that comparison so what they say is this jhana its root form is jayati to burn up so this jhana, this state of samadhi is born from pure concentration. So the amygdala shuts down the parts of the brain that do all of the, the um, conceptualizing, the experiencing of our outside reality just start to shut down. And there's this inner process which happens physically. They've looked at this in an MRI scanner, people going into jhana, and they can see a flood of dopamine it's a self-stimulating dopamine uh, system so the whole body is flooded with dopamine and uh, the body shakes so this sort of happens in a kundalini experience the body starts shaking and there's bliss and rapture through the whole body like an orgasmic feeling but in everywhere and um, this is said to burn up the karma the old karma the heavy karma not all of it I mean, I suppose some people will have such a full experience that that's it. I mean, they, that that is their full awakening. Um, but most people will have it partially. And in jhana, you, you keep doing it to clean the body out so that your body is pure, relaxed, no tension. So it's like a fast track way to... I guess so. I get potentially if that opportunity is utilized. And I think this is the thing. Lots of people have had Kundalini experiences, but they've never meditated afterwards. And maybe 50 years after the experience, 20 years after the experience, it's faded into a past memory. This is the thing. I think it's, it is an opportunity uh, to move beyond just the Kundalini experience. Um, but uh, many people don't take it because they think, oh, this is it. I'm enlightened, you, you know, there's, um, I mean, obviously every, everyone has a very different experience. I couldn't say that that was the, the case for everyone. Of course not. Um, maybe I've something. Many people um, within the Kundalini Collective, I've met some other people talking about Kundalini as a, as a process and as, a, and as a process that's really lifelong. So they, you know, there may be initial big eruption um, and it may then get a lot quieter Mm -hmm. yeah but actually in the background the process is, is still going on and, and yeah the idea being the process being towards con i guess being connected with the self with the capital s so the, the unitary consciousness and letting go of the of the creative self which we know from sociology is just creative yeah um, yeah do you, do you, do you think that's in some people that's not the case it oh yeah created. yeah i know i think you're right i mean I, you know I can't, I'm, I'm just sort of um, hesitating a guess at this, you know, I mean, this is based on these ideas or what I feel about it is based on, I suppose, research of scriptures and talking to people who've had their experience decades ago and looking at and different people who have either practiced or not practiced the extent of their Kundalini experience, what happened particularly with their Kundalini awakening, you know, all of these things, I think, um, 
should be taken into account in terms of what happens next. But yeah, absolutely. I mean, there is a concept in early Buddhism called it's the four path model uh, where the you have an experience so profound. So you see all the layers to existence or, or the, the, the one that you dissolve so much that they they have an experience what's called stream entry. And in this tradition, they say you have seven more lifetimes until you're enlightened. You've entered a stream. And I think maybe, you know, there's something similar going on with Kundalini. You've entered a stream of Dharma. Mm. You've seen things that you just can't unsee. That changes your psychology forever. And even though your life might unfold and maybe you you might go into depression, you might go in, have terrible things happen or pl- amazing things happen. Nonetheless, that awareness of something else is there and I don't think it will go away. Depends what you do with it, I suppose. One thing that I've noticed uh, from the Kundalini Collective, from my own experience and, and just speaking to people, is that um, the process isn't blissful. And it's, mm. it, it's uh, even though it's described in Hindi scriptures as being blissful and, and nectar, a lot of people have difficult and troubling times mm. Mm. or challenging times, let's say. So um, it seems like the modern day Kundalini Awakening person is not always having a an, an easy time of it and they're not experiencing bliss. Mm. So what are your thoughts about this and, and, and why is there this difference and what can someone do from your own experience that can help them through the process? Yeah, gosh, I mean, everyone has a different experience with this. Um, I think context is really helpful. Um, I think I think to understand what you're going through allows you to feel safe there's a part of you that can feel safe through it um context i mean by context is uh, the scriptures indian scriptures have created context and they're all very beautiful it's all towards something beautiful something amazing you know and it's seen with such reverence and devotion so that's what i mean by context that holds the experience so even though you're having a wobbly time there's that going on there's that whole societal understanding which can hold someone through the experience we don't have that and i know lots of people have been through the psychiatric system whilst having this kundalini experience because the the hallucinations the visions can be really strong sometimes quite dark um the I want to speak about this from two angles because there is the wellness model in Western society and then there's the liberation model. And I think they're quite different in terms of what they both want to achieve. The wellness model wants to make a functioning human being who can realize their full potential in society. Whereas the enlightenment models are designed to help someone completely free themselves from human emotions like hate greed pain you know this is this is these are really different um frameworks we're looking at so i mean i guess the question is where do we uh, how how someone going through that of course it is helpful to be able to function in society i'm just thinking i know now that we have psychiatrists who work on a transpersonal level who can look at past trauma and help someone resolve those issues, which is very helpful because ultimately I do think that the difficulty with Kundalini is your subconscious trauma coming to the surface and you experience that emotionally. Um, Whereas in the Buddhist model, you're supposed to feel the suffering of that. You're supposed to get terrified. You're supposed to get hurt. You're supposed to feel pain to the nth degree. And that that sounds more, but it's about understanding the nature of suffering. If someone tells you, oh, that's okay, you won't go through it to the depth and you won't get the kind of sweet release that is supposed to happen when you know what suffering is. 
And that, again, is a process. Whereas in our society, we wouldn't condone that in, on, in a wellness model. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, it's funny you say that because um, I, mean, I, I, would, I, would, I would go one step further backwards than that um, in the sense that we understand the world in, in, a, in a binary sense. So you know, good, good, bad and so forth. And we see pain as as something that's bad we should yeah. think. and I mean I had a very difficult um initial very, and very powerful initial coming away from what six years ago and I, and I suppose it was very traumatic and very painful in lots of ways I mean I I, I ended up being admitted to hospital for six weeks and that was that was a nightmare mm-hmm. and I couldn't really function and I thought I was dying I actually thought I was dying mm-hmm. um but when I look back on it when I look back on it, it doesn't seem like a bad experience. Mm, mm. Uh, honestly, it doesn't. It's just that I was perceiving it in that way. So that the way what I'm trying to say is we we perceive pain in a certain way, but on, on a on a higher level, it's not how we perceive it. It's mm-hmm. actually a teacher. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, I um, mean, I think it's part of the pro- The difficulty is part of the process. I mean, I, I remember my dad telling me about an experience he had when he was going through it. He was in Tokyo and there was a guy pulling a fish out of the tank. It was still alive, a fishmonger, and slit the belly open of this fish. And my dad described how he felt the knife go through his own belly. So he felt the pain of the fish. So this sort of, people are suffering, you know, this is sentient beings suffer. And there's a sensitivity that happens through the Kundalini process. And this is good, that's supposed to happen to become more sensitive is a good thing um to support that would be to raise the love raise the compassion you don't want to dull your senses you want to remain open but we need more compassion more love to cope with it is there a difference between somebody who let's say lives in a city like london has a a spontaneous awakening maybe we should define that if you can define what a spontaneous awakening is compared to your mm. traditional Buddhist or Hindu initiate who would have had a guru give them mm. Shakti Pat. Mm. What's hap- what is, in your opinion, because it's just an opinion now, I guess, what do you think is happening and why is it happening and what's the difference? Gosh. I, I, I think it's always been the same since time began. I think, I think it's just society's reflection of it. Uh, I, think the exper- I think what people are experiencing now is when they have kundalini awakenings and the insights that they experience it is ancient it's an ancient force it's like people have experiences of the creation you know the, this is a it, within the tantric traditions this is a force that created all things in the universe this is not even the beyond the universe this is um And this is what you experience when you go through it. And I don't, I think no matter what civilization or society you're in, the experience will be the same. Maybe some of the psychological apparitions will be a reflection of what culture you come from, uh, what religion you are, or what um, your makeup, what what your experiences are as a human. Um, But you break that down. This is, well, obviously, there's no way to prove this or study this or explore this, but this is my hunch. <laughs> um, as far as um, I do feel like as a society, though, when I look on the Internet for various healing modalities, you know, you look around and it's incredible what's available now regarding dealing with trauma, healing methods, psychology or understanding of psychology our openness to transcendental consciousness, you know, it, it's it, the way science and physics explores the quantum consciousness, that all of this stuff is, we're starting to create frameworks in all different fields for this kind of mind expansion process, which um, 20 years ago wouldn't have been the case. You know, you go to a doctor, psychiatrist, and you start talking about some of your experiences, they wouldn't really know how to place it. Whereas now, it's like, oh yeah. That's well, so not... sure, to be honest, and I think I think uh, psychiatric services, you know, the mental health services, still have a very materialistic framework 
very mature and, right. they, and they can't it's very very rare for, for for these experiences to be grasped they, they tend to be pathologized right mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah but, how long ago was it when when you went through this no, six years, but I, I, I'm, I'm involved with the group called Spiritual Crisis Network and we're supporting people the whole time. Um, and this is very much the case now. That the, mm-hmm. And modern day psychiatrists, well, my nephew's been trained in psychiatry and, and it, it's, it does see, see the body as, as almost like a machine. There's mm-hmm. not, it's not mm-hmm. even a sociological sense, let mm-hmm. alone a spiritual one. Um, but, um, That's interesting. Yeah. Sorry, I, I was going to sort of go back a bit to connects to something that Samir was asking but I wanted to ask um, because a lot of people going through Kundalini it is, can be really quite a difficult process mm. I, I wanted to ask in, in what ways does you know, if someone has how can traditional models um, practically support people through some of the mm-hmm. different parts of Kundalini could you say I think could you just have to say something about that yeah, that there are practices um, that shape the mind and how you view oneself. There's many different practices, and traditionally they would. So, for instance, there's a text called the Vishuddhi Magga, which is an old Buddhist um, text which the Theravadans would use in their practice, and they have discerned different psycho- psychological types, and they have um, described different practices for different psychological types to help. Um, uh, what's the word, appease the egoic tendencies of that particular mind, that particular person. Some some people have a very greedy mind. Some people have an aversion mind, like a hateful mind. Some people have a lazy mind. Some people have an overactive mind. So all of these different states, uh, different types of mind um, will create certain hindrances when Kundalini is happening or certain kinds of suffering psychological suffering when kundalini is happening so they prescribe it's like the plastic is because of the plasticity of the brain certain practices done you know wholeheartedly will change the architecture of the brain and to lessen um, a particular thought process which will ease um ease the flow of prana through the body, ease the flow of energy, kundalini energy through the body. But fundamentally, fundamentally, one practice that they would prescribe to all people is metta bhavna, loving kindness, which um, is so important on so many levels because what you're doing, a lot of a lot of the difficult experiences, fear that arises, just fear of um of of the, what's happening the literally the ground beneath you is being ripped away so that causes a lot of fear in people i mean this is just one of the experiences i suppose that people struggle with um and the metta bhavana you start with loving kindness you start with in this in the early buddhist tradition you start with um kind thoughts to, towards the self may i be well may i be happy you make this wish for the self through doing that practice you genuinely relax so it, it actually they found it to relax that part of the brain which kicks in when you need to survive it, it eases the fear you start to feel safe and that's really really important when you go through this experience is to feel safe mm. um now that can be hard if it's so this is where tan- the tantric experience explains Kundalini quite well. Sometimes the Kundalini can be going on so strong that you're acting out the behavior of a deity, for instance. In Tibet, my Tibetan professor would describe going for walks in the hills with people and, and they would get deity possession and then it, they'd snarl and do the mudra. But then it'd pass and it'd be normal and they'd be fine and they'd crack on with their walk, you know, and that was normal. That's not really accepted in our culture to do that when you're at the pub. So, um, so I don't, I don't know. I think that's having a good friends finding like what you guys provide a network of people who understand, who can contain or support people through those experiences um, where you can go somewhere safe, beautiful, natural to let those experience out where you're not um, 
in the supermarket, maybe where you might trigger people to react, which in turn will cause problems for yourself. So, yeah, it's about creating a safe space for yourself, a safe network, safe feeling in the brain. First and foremost, I would say. And I think that that's certainly the system that the, the Buddhist, early Buddhists. Also in, in Vajrayana Buddhism, they would prostrate to a deity. So before you go into any kind of tummo practice, which is the Kundalini practices, you do thousands and thousands and thousands of prostrations. So you are bowing down to the deity. And through doing that, you are lessening yourself. Yourself is becoming less important. The deity is becoming more important. So when Kundalini ravages through your body, you're worshipping the deity. There's no you anymore. So these traditions would hold those experiences in different ways, I suppose. So it sounds like um, you don't you don't see any differences between people waking up in the old eastern paths and what's going on today. How would that explain the numbers of people who are waking up spontaneously? And, and, and the example I'll give is that something that I've read about Hindu Hindu practice is that they would say there's only two ways to have a Kundalini awakening. The first way is to have 20 years of very ascetic yoga with mm. a guru. Well, you've got other ways, Shakti Pat. Mm. And to the extent when I first had an awakening many years ago, a lot of people were saying it's not possible to have an awakening without uh -huh. one, of, one of those two. Yeah. So there's something about spontaneous. So that we're having spontaneous, whether it's triggered by an accident or by hallucinogens or by mm -hmm. something. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. Do you have any thoughts about that? The number of spontaneous, or if, even if you wanted to find it spiritual awakenings rather than convenience. Yeah. How, how was yours tri triggered? What 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 happened to you? How did how did it all go off? I can contextualize this within the six months before that happened. I had a really bad sighted experience that uh, ha that allowed me because I was laid flat on my back for six weeks and I couldn't really do anything to really think about my life and to realize that I needed to change a lot of things in my life. One of the things was to uh, do a bit of yoga, do a bit of, I never thought about yoga before or never thought about meditation, but just, just to create space. So having a sciatica problem began to help me understand that I needed to look at something a bit more uh, spacious in my life. But because of this, it opened up all these questions. And uh, around uh, Easter time in 2006, I began to have these really big intuitions and really strange experiences that led to spontaneous movement when mm. I came back when I came back from it. I used I began to I just knew my hands were about to move and they began to form mudras. Mm -hmm. And the, the mudras still happen today. Uh, and the, the the pain in my sciatic nerve was still there although I could walk. And the first thing the mudras did was hover hover over my chakras, starting specific finger movements and then it started contorting me into positions that helped my back. Mm -hmm. resolve itself mm -hmm. but um it wasn't uh you know it, it was I, I wouldn't call it a traditional awakening experience i also um would say that it was uh it wasn't my spine uh you know and flames coming up my spine and like me having some piercing of the crown it almost felt like something coming into me and then something mm -hmm. rising from my heart, and it's like a mixing of energies. It mm -hmm. wasn't a traditional, you know, spine flame. So anyway, so so mm -hmm. I, I've never really had a full, a full understanding of the model of my awakening, which is kind of why I like having these conversations. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's so that's, interesting. That's, can I just make a comment about that as well? Um, there's also, you know, the, the, the Western Hermetic tradition, and... and uh, it's like with shamanism, which, which has, is co common throughout the world. I mean, all these traditions, they're just different paths up the same mountain, and they, and they all do connect. And anyway, within the, the Western esoteric tradition, the energy is brought, is brought, is top down, go, goes from top down. And it's such a seems it seems to be a safer process. That's what people people say. Mm -hmm. So, so it, sounds, it sounds like you know you almost had like a sort of a 
bit oh. of east, a bit of east and a bit of west all at once. I do remember having a series, a series of intuitions over a number of years later on, uh, look, specific, look, specifically looking into the Egyptian mm. background, mm. into the idea, it's just, you know, almost as if there's two ways of an awakening experience. There's the Indian model where it goes up and there's an Egyptian model where it goes down. Mm-hmm. And the Egyptian, and it's not written anywhere. You could deduce it from writings and from history. And, and it, it, I had some crazy experiences in, in Egypt. Um, um, and, um, you know, what, there's this, uh, a couple of books that, that write about um, the Egyptian initiation ceremony. You, you use the pyramid not as a, a tomb. In fact, it was never meant to be a tomb. It's an initiation space let's say it's it's a building where the energies on the right days of the year if you put yourself in the sarcophagus you raise your energy with the right ritual mm-hmm. and it, it, uh, it integrates energy from outside into your body mm-hmm. one of the first books that i read that was recommended to me when i didn't know what's going on and i i want to see some kind of spiritual person um she said i don't know what, what you're going through I don't understand what you're going through, but I do recognize some of the spontaneous movements from a book that I read. It's called Initiation by Elizabeth Fike. And she was a yoga teacher in Germany uh, in the 1900s and 1950s who had memories of a past life in Egypt. And she wrote about these memories and they're so, so detailed and so profound. You know, when you read it, you think no one can make it up. And they talk about a yoga system in Egypt Mm. where you go to the pyramids and you have these initiation ceremonies where you raise your energy levels but they don't link it to the indian system mm. yes i've heard of this yeah, yeah. the, the yeah. kesmet i think it was ancient egypt was kesmet and they had a breathing pranayama system in there yes and, yeah yeah yeah. We, yeah but it but it, it's it's different if you when you read about it it's got a different quality to how you think about kundalini in indian context mm. There are some big similarities. I've read about this stuff as well. There's a, a book I really, really enjoy called, called the, the Lost Art of Resurrection. And it, and it was it, the, the guy who wrote it is a, uh, is a archaeologist and also sp- sp- spiritual, has a spiritual perspective. And he put forward a very good argument. It's what, what you're saying um, around various things that weren't actually tombs. They were there for ritual purposes. And which in Egypt and also Mesopotamia and so forth. And but the theory is it's like in, in, um, in spiritual awakening, a lot of people have this experience of their, of de- of their dying. Um, and you could say, well, that's part of the ego dying. Um, and that was that that became very much, it would seem, or no, no one really knows, but it, anyway, people theorize this is very much in those kind of. Um, rituals that happened in say in the, the king's chamber in, in the great period pyramid mm-hmm. there's so various documentary um evidence or people's various stories uh, alistair crown <laughs> and also the person who wrote this book the last art of resurrection had had an experience within that sarcophagus um mm-hmm. so also oh, if we're, gone, we're gone off piece to this here oh. no it's all fascinating stuff and so, i think it's all very relevant this is this is you know your your describing i think this is so true this is a global phenomenon this is a human yeah. phenomenon every culture has um a some some story about this some uh history of it you, you know in the in their in their system of beliefs like it, it's 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 not you know it doesn't originate from one culture i don't think this is a no one owns it it's, no. it's as old as time you know there, there is a book i recommend that talks about a Gnostic or Christian kind of mm. context. Mm. Yes. Yeah. Uh, what's it called? It's, it's called, I think it's called the, it's called the Secret Temple of Solomon. I'll, I'll, it's in my bookshelf. I'll have to oh. Uh, oh. I'll tell you later on, but it's by Victoria LePage. And it's, and it says that if you look at, she, she said, she cites the Gnostic Gospels, uh, particularly the Gospel of Philip, which is not in the, in the synoptic Catholic Gospels. And there's a, a ritual of the bridal chamber. And uh, it says the bridal chamber is the highest sacrament of all the sacraments, where the bridegroom and, and bride come together. And her idea, her theory is, is, is that there was a sacred sexual ceremony. You had to be initiated into it, and you had to be, and it was a, within the temple itself. So the building. This is in the energy, Christianity. Or... In Christianity. In right, okay. Christianity. okay, right. 
And so, um, so Christ in the Gospel of Philip says that the highest sacrament is the sacrament of the bridal chamber. It's not in the, it's not, not, not mentioned elsewhere. And it's mm-hmm. the idea that the male and the female or the feminine and masculine come together. Mm-hmm. And there's a metaphorical context and there's a, 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 a almost sexual context, but it's quite similar to Tantra. Mm. Um, and and um, there was, there's documentary evidence of female priestesses who were initiated into some higher sect, higher sect where they were, they were almost priestesses, but they were engaged in sexual Mm-hmm. Uh, intercourse with, with men who would, and they would enter some kind of I guess enlightened state of consciousness mm-hmm. um, so the Gnostic Gospels and, and Gnostic philosophy has this idea within it and it's how you interpret it it's not Kundalini it's not called Kundalini and it's not called um, and it's not called enlightenment in the same way mm-hmm. but the idea was is that you achieve union with God yeah. within, within yeah. this and, it, and it's pretty similar to the idea of, you know, yoga is Shiva and Shakti and yoga means union. Mm-hmm. Um, it's just a different way of getting to that space. Um, and, and, and the idea is, is, is that the Catholic Church in the Council of Nicaea decided to, to do away with anything that would allow you to go to God without having something in between political. Mm-hmm. And so it disassociated itself from any gospel that allowed you to experience God within. And it, mm-hmm. it chose the Gospels where you have to get to God through an institution. Mm-hmm. So the, the politics of Christianity corrupted the actual spiritual identity of it. But um, the it's idea is that it's actually in, it's actually in there. It's, yeah. in there. But, it's so fascinating, though. I mean, I, I think that Kundalini, the Kundalini experience or that you, those unions that you were describing, you know, like a shape religion, which in turn shape society but what we've got is there are there are experiences within the the kundalini process which are not conducive to building a structured safe society a lot of the kundalini experiences involve breaking down those social constructs those human constructs of what is the self but we need those constructs to feed people to house people to heal people to educate people and it's we need we need to thrive like as humans on this planet in an, in some kind of organized ways. I mean, I suppose there's arguments about like chaotic systems, but for, in some way, this relationship between human society and the Kundalini experience has been this conversation since time began. So how do we order society? How do we achieve liberation? And it's like, it, there's, it's interesting watching. I mean, I don't know much about the Western culture, but watching the way, tantric ritual has changed how vedic ritual has changed and how that's informed structures within society and vice versa you know like the left hand path in the tantric system so sexual union is would be practices within some aspects and now this is really this isn't neo tantra this isn't just about eroticism this is about something that transcends eroticism it's it's about liberation but those practices were deemed inappropriate for for a family man or woman with children um, because that family unit needed to be held safe so we could raise psychologically healthy children so that 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 yeah it's like this this how do we place it's a constant conversation how do we place those experiences or rituals or sacred uh, unions in society at the same time protecting safe boundaries for everyone to grow and thrive it's a yeah I've always found that fascinating you touched on that with just you know looking at Christianity like I I don't know I don't know what, what's right or yeah, wrong I, 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 I would see it as a slightly different framework I mean um so the framework I would see is, is that traditionally if you go, go all the way back to Egypt probably um that these processes which have been and which could continue be essential are about trying about reaching the truth, mm. uh, which, which I would see to be my, my, in my frame it would be unity consciousness. Um, now, what I would like to think is happening now, it might could just be my fantasy, is that these experiences are, are now widening widening out from the, the from the elite, um, mm. and yes. are becoming more general experiences. Now, I think 
that act in my framework, this is what society needs because it, it doesn't mean it doesn't mean you, you can't still operate as a self. It means you don't identify with it. And so mm. if you identify with unitary consciousness, but you know you still like your operating system to yourself, mm-hmm. then then you're going to act in a way that is actually for the benefit of the the the, the all rather than individual illusions of no, of no the, of the importance of wealth and so forth mm-hmm. and you no know, our society has come to the stage where if we don't actually see the truth behind the unitary you know, the fact that everything is one um humans are going to destroy themselves and m- 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 much other life on this planet in the process so yeah that that needs to be the motivation doesn't it that the the motivation behind the structures like structures that enable self-actualization ultimately yes i was going to say the, the what's got humans in in a, this mess w- w- that humans are created is the fact that not enough people have been spiritually awakened mm. and and identify with it with this the, the creator self and ego are at, and, and then are activated to build up their ego and build up their wealth to the detriment of every everything else yeah um, so i think yeah. if, then the, to me the more the, the more people that that do have spiritual awakenings of Kundalini and other kinds, um, though it's all connected, the, the more hope there is, is, is for humanity. So I don't think it, you know, if, if lots of people have these experiences, it's not going to dismantle the structures, it's going to create, help create a new structure that, that is more sustainable. I, I, I agree. I tend to agree. I think there's a, a, a natural um, compassion that arises which wants to support the evolution of society, the 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 evolution of humankind in that you know eradicate eradicate as much suffering as possible on earth i mean that that would certainly be a motivation or you were talking about samir you were talking about guidance a sense of being guided i think that's a really common experience people feel like that this is an this is an intelligent force and there is some guidance like that's taking you towards a, a certain purpose in your life or an action or service towards the betterment. Yeah, I, I would definitely agree with that. I think what I've learned along the way is it's not a guiding hand that gives you all the answers. It's mm. a guiding hand that um, allows you to make sometimes big mistakes. Um, it doesn't take away the human experience of learning from trial and error but it gives you a sixth sense or a new intuition that you can add to your normal senses which after a while when you begin to see the pattern you realize um that there is uh, an intelligent force behind everything um i have extrapolated from that i don't believe things happen randomly anymore i i I, it's, it's been too coincidental there's been too many synergies in my life um, or synchronicity, should I say, for me now to recognise randomness. And to some extent, it also has made me understand a different idea of what free will is, that actually, um, in my experience, that the, the free will that I thought was free will was actually something that made me suffer much more. Um, mm-hmm. And that, and that the Kundalini has given me a sense of um, uh, free will without time and space, so that I can at certain moments in my life, look at myself and recognize that everything has happened and everything's already happened and nothing's happening at all. Mm-hmm. And there, 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 there's an equanimity in that, in that moment. So when I come back from that experience, it might take me years to integrate that experience into my life, but it also gives me a lot of comfort, whereas in the past it might have given me a lot of fear. Mm-hmm. And so it's been an interesting journey of recognizing that, that, that there's a fundamental force behind all things and that fundamental force is actually good. Mm-hmm. Even though my, 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 my pain and suffering from Kundalini is painful and, and suffering, uh, actually underneath it all, there's, there's, there's a rationale and a love, there's a deep, deep, deep love behind it all, mm-hmm. which um, is really difficult to, to articulate to somebody who's new to the journey and who's suffering a lot. 
because of what they're going to Plus, to say, I, I, I totally agree with that. I was trying to say that earlier. I didn't put it very well. When I talk about what's, what at a time seems like real pain, is actually in the long run, is, it, was, is actually underneath benevolent, benevolent because it's part of the whole process of moving forwards. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, yeah, I agree. It's like the universe is conspiring to help you realise yourself. Mm. Yeah, yeah, but, 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 but the Kundini has brought me, it, it, I, I may have not noticed it before, and now through trial and error and learning a new language of my, my, the energy in me, I can now understand there's a pattern to a lot of the seemingly randomness, randomness, which is not randomness anymore. So it's a strange journey. Um, but but it, uh, the positive is, is that I find it harder and harder and harder, although I can still do it, to, to, to hate or to fight or, or, to, or to want to hurt. I mean, I still can get to that point. But mm-hmm. I can begin to see, okay, well, there's another side, of, there's another perspective, or there's another side to, to my own perspective. And I need to kind of reverse my own opinion and see their position. And I think this is one of the great things of the journey is that it's given me that, that way of thinking about things. Mm. Yeah, I, I think that's like, you definitely hit the nail on the head in terms of if we were to measure growth which I think that's maybe problematic in and of itself, but because it's not really, we don't want to think about it as if we are bad and we need to improve. But if we're growing in compassion or love, Mm. then that's a good indicator that you're on the right path. Mm. Like I think that in itself, like if Mm. you have more capacity for forgiveness, more capacity Mm. for love, more capacity for compassion, then they, that's a good signifier like of, of, of how you're doing <laughs> maybe you have to go backwards a bit to go forwards I don't know but you know there's yeah I think that's that's definitely um an important thing to process of going through this experience or or, or steer towards I mean yeah two two very quick pretty irrelevant points uh, I mean John Lennon is John Lennon did say all you need is love and I think he was right <laughs> the other thing is little um, I talked to this to Sam in before. A little visualization I've always had is that, well, the idea that when a higher dimension um, the, comes into the third dimension, everything gets split up. So imagine like light hitting a, a big diamond and getting reflect, reflected into all these small little pieces. But on a higher dimension, they're all one. Mm-hmm. I think it love is, just, is the pieces coming back together again. Mm-hmm. Oh, that's a beautiful way of putting it. It was interesting when you, Samir, were describing your experience the, the, in, in tantric uh, description. And, and Alan, this is, this is kind of what you are describing as well just now. Um, those mudras, uh, what, what they also do is it, within tantric uh, ritual, the practitioner would intextualize the body with what's called bija or sound syllables and so the they would kind of draw the sound syllable onto the body and the sound syllable um, or bija is like an energetic signature of an aspect of the universe and a bija is made up of different rays of light and so each bija is assigned a, uh, a range of uh, these light beams I suppose that's what it would be described as in, in tantric philosophy. So you're intextualizing the whole body with this sort of symphony of light and sound. And that, and you reminded me of that, Alan, when you described the pyramid uh, fracturing all the light into different rays. And that's exactly what the, the, the human body is in the tantric system. So these bija were just made up of all of these kind of uh, signatures of light and sound. And through ritual, you place them on the body and you purify the body so you can reverse the process back to that original one light source. And so what you were describing, Samir, with your experience is very typical of a tantric ritual uh, of the, um, the deity. The deity is the, uh, the bija. So a bija, the deity is a personification of a bija of the sound syllables. So the practitioner kind of goes through this sort of dance in a way of all the different deities. 
or the beaders enacting all of these different attitudes or signatures uh, of consciousness? Um, I never knew that. Uh, there was definitely um, a sense that there was a dance. I, mean, I can describe it metaphorically at the dance, but then there's the, there was definitely a literal Shakti dance where I, where I would have to just kind of look. I can still do it now. I can just pause for a second and I can get into it. And it's like it's doing something to my energy field and it's placing things in certain areas and moving it about. And um, uh, the long and the short of it is, is that it gave me a lot of intuitions, opened up a lot of things, maybe a bit too quickly. And so in the first couple of years, I had a lot of very cosmic experiences without being very grounded. And without the groundedness, you get um, a false ego. You also can't sustain those experiences and it, and it can be quite difficult psychologically to understand what you're doing. But, but there was this sense that there was a different dance and a different set of mudras, a different quality of energy um, on different days and, and, and different visualizations, different. I got oh, yeah. There's a whole science to this, yeah. like the, yeah. the, the planetary alignments, all of it yeah. is all linked into this, the different, I suppose, light signatures within the body and how they manifest. It's like a clock. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's how I, feel. I still feel it today. I feel like there's a clock and it's working with my energy. And I, I now know that like, the, the sun and the moon and the stars are all linked to it. I don't try and pay attention to it. I'm not into that. Mm. Yeah. But I recognise that the, um, the, you know, where the Earth is, and which, and, and it's always Easter. Easter is always the moment, or I call it Easter. It could, you know, it could be past Wait that. Up. Yeah, yeah. That's the time when my energy blows up completely, like I can feel it coming now. It's and very the, common. Yeah. Kundalini's all happen, not all, but many Kundalini experiences happen at Waysack, the first full moon in May. Right. So that, 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 so that's, that was my initial awakening experience. And then a year later, I had my most profound experience in, in, in Egypt and Sinai. The year later, I had a similar experience in Sinai again, all over Passover and Easter. And mm -hmm. in England, ever since then, I know the energy gets a lot more um, volatile in my body. Around time for practice, isn't it? Time for it. retreat. I think this this is it. I mean that that, that way sack that May is a important time to go in and access that part. That's when it's at its most potent. That's um they talk about so many interesting esoteric, very esoteric um places or junctions, or how would you describe it? Maybe almost astral in a sense, uh, meetings or gatherings that happen around Waysack. If, if you're prone to astral travel, which is, which is quite common, I think, in Kundalini sorry, experiences. Sorry, could you just express um, Way, Waysack? Could you just say again what yeah, is? It's, it, um, is, it, is, it, is it from Buddhist tradition? Yeah, it is, yeah, it's from the Buddhist tradition. It's supposedly the day that the Buddha got enlightened. It's right. also um, um, known as a meeting a kind of cosmic meeting in an astral plane. I mean, now we're getting really out there, but, um, <laughs> but, um, and, and there's a gathering of enlightened beings, I guess you could say at this point, this astral place, Waysack. And that's, it's and that's uh, early May. first full moon in May. Yeah, yeah, Most see. traditions would celebrate this full moon. And of course the meaning and everything would, would change according to the tradition, but it's, yeah, it, it, Buddhist monks would meditate all night throughout this 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 way sack. It's quite important this full moon. Um, but yeah, it's it's a, it's an interesting uh, interesting concept, an important concept. And like, yeah, so you're saying your strong experiences happened particularly around that time, did they? Uh, especially initially, for the right. first few years, the awakening experience, and then very very cosmic experiences that, that retrospectively. I can say now I felt uh, drawn or I was given the means to go to certain places, which was mm -hmm. in this case was specifically the Sinai coast of the Red oh, Sea okay, right. during Passover, during Easter, literally on those days, while I had massively awakening experiences in the first couple of years, almost like I was given a download. Like I was just... Right, yeah. Um, and, and then it took me a couple of years to integrate those experiences. I couldn't integrate them in the first couple of years. It, it was too much. And... I was very ungrounded. Mm -hmm. 
and then subsequently what the only way that I could um, communicate to myself not to anybody else I still probably can't communicate it to anyone else was I got this intuition to make a set of tarot cards which I think Alan's seen um, uh, and uh, weirdly a board game <laughs> sounds really weird but a board game um, and uh, I got an uh, intuition of a, a map of the body like an energetic system and I'm still to this day understanding it I'd say I'm much I'm more attuned to it now than I was when it first came to me I didn't even understand it but um, it all came during Easter. Mm-hmm, that's interesting, isn't it? Yeah. How, Alan, would you say that that this that this full moon, that May full moon, had any I don't know, profound? I'll, I'll give it a go this year. That's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't. I don't know. I, mean, I think generally it is a good. It, it is a time of renewal, isn't it? And, it, mm. and there's um, May May days. Of, um, I live in Oxford. And May Day is a big deal in Oxford now. It's, it's always it's, it's a it's a one of the sort of pagan festivals. And I suppose I I've intuitively feel quite connected mm. to, to to that tradition and and yeah. also um, to say um, a sense of place. So ever since I was a very young child, I've always been driven to um, sorry attracted to places like Avebury and Stonehenge and so forth. And mm-hmm. so I feel that mm-hmm. I feel that connection to, to me too. Place. Oh yeah, I think definitely there's places that can trigger it as well, sort of sacred uh, or unknown places that are known for their sacred appeal. I suppose all over the world, and, like we were discussing again, earlier. I, I go back to the previous conversation. I had a very um, myself and Samir did a, um, a couple of years ago. We did a Kundalini field trip. Oh, excellent! Oh, brilliant! <laughs> That's great. Uh, which which entailed. Um, Going to um, Avebury, and then we went to Long Kennet, a uh, West Kennet Long Barrow, which is an amazing Long Barrow. And um, anyway, the next day um, we went to um, the Rollwright Stones in Oxfordshire. Oh yeah! And um, there's this guy giving a, a guided tour of, of ley lines. <laughs> amazing! Uh, but the interesting thing was just the, well, the relevant, a lot of interesting. The relevant thing was got in conversation with him, and he was. Um, I can't remember his name off the top of my head, but he was an expert about West Kennet Long, um, Longborough. And he's mm-hmm. um, written various books about it. And when myself and Samir were in the, um, the burial chamber, it felt more than the burial chamber. Mm-hmm. And um, sh- mm-hmm. sure enough, this guy was saying it was, it was used for rituals and it was used for rituals that we've been talking about. That mm-hmm. he, he thought it was used for these kind of rebirth to, no, to, to, to die to die in the self to to um yeah yeah um, yeah i don't know to be rebirthed you know in the conscious in the consciousness <clears throat> so there's, no, he, there's he, a lot of so, yeah you know, i mean who knows, who knows but it's, it's say it, it what we're talking about goes back a long long way mm. yeah. oh absolutely and i think this planet is a living entity in itself you know and there are i suppose chakras and nadis on this planet as well i mean i i certainly believe that i think there's power points where these things happen more readily i remember it on one summer solstice i used years ago when i was much younger i used to go to the stonehenge summer solstice celebrations oh uh, yeah they were great i mean just the diversity of people that were there and i remember my friend who isn't who is spiritual i guess but not into yoga not into anything like that it's really extraordinary she wasn't high or drunk or anything and she, her hands spontaneously just started, and she was like, oh, my God, what's going on? Her hands just started spontaneously moving into this ritualized dance. And she's going through this, freaking out, going, what's going on? And this was at Stonehenge at the solstice. Wow. And she said she felt that she was bringing energy from, it felt like energy from the earth and up above joining together through her. And it was her body that was somehow managing this. But yeah, it was quite comedy in the way that she was um, exhilarated at the same time. What the fuck is going on? <laughs> like, like, yeah, yeah. I think it's. I think it's. Uh, this is what all of the traditions seem to point at, isn't it? Uh, can I suggest an idea? Because there are a couple more topics I want to. Like to talk about, but rather than carry on, 
we could always do a part two if you both want to. But yeah, it's great talking to you guys. It's, yeah, it's, yeah. it's, it's great. <laughs> I, I, I read us some notes down, and, I, and one of you know you mentioned um, desire for God versus societal duty. I mm. think the idea of, of, of these how spiritual frameworks affect social frameworks. Mm. Um, so so um, it's really about the wider context of spiritual awakening. You know, from we've talked about the personal journey, the individual journey mm. in this uh, podcast, but there's also an allusion to something bigger, collective, mm-hmm. yeah. societal. Yeah, and, 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 absolutely. And, you know, that could be a kind of broad outline for a second discussion and then we can split it into two. Yeah, I mean, this has been so much, that has been very much a part of my journey. Like I was raised with theosophical ideology. Like my dad named me after Annie Besant, who was a social activist. Yeah. And, and, sh- and so I would when I was interested in this spiritual journey, I was in India a lot, um, going off into the mountains. And he, I just remember he used to get really raggy. He's Glaswegian. And he'd just be like, God, come down from the mountains. That's a rubbish Glaswegian accent. But he, you know, he'd say, you've got to do your duty in society. You have to serve society. This is, this is not for you just to go off into the mountains and enjoy yourself. You, you, you must, uh, contribute I mean for your your dharma mm. and that and that really yeah and it what I suppose what framed his ideology and much of my own purpose in life is this is, uh, the theosophical society talk about it a lot is a kind of a plan um an evolutionary plan I suppose for for humankind I mean it's controversial as well because there's a lot of things from the theosophical society which if we brought into today's um uh frameworks would be very questionable you know um but I wonder if that's just the way it's understood but I mean that's something to unpack and it's not my area of expertise so I I I don't um know too much about it but certainly the the concept of, of how kundalini was placed um, in this theosophical context was that you are becoming a part of a, a brotherhood of of servers for humankind not only humankind but beyond earth beyond um uh our solar system so it really de- yeah that, that that philosophy really does go into into that in quite some depth which is interesting i mean it does seem that there's a an idea behind Kundalini that if you do align yourself with the journey and, and help, it cleanses you, it puts you in a more authentic place. And that more authentic place is a purpose and that purpose has some kind of mission. So, so, so it, it sometimes feels to me that like, Kundalini is like a chess player. It's mm-hmm. moving us into positions. <laughs> yeah, it's yeah. it's kind of clearing like us. And, yeah. then, and, 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 and we may have gone in one direction and now we're going in another direction. Yeah. Um, yeah, and it's like you're having to wait for certain timings or, or things in your life to settle yeah. or or tie up loose ends almost, and then that thing can happen. And it's um, I have to say the framework that I identify with, which Bonnie Granwell, you know, oh yeah, you know, I mean, I've got a huge amount of respect for Bonnie. Granwell. She's lovely, yeah, and um, you know, it's, it's, no, she so sadly died in January. Um, oh yes, of course, uh, yeah, but. I mean, so it's, it's, it's the perspective that um, you know, Kundalini is a journey from identifying with the self, with the smallest, the, the, the created self, as, as you said, like sociologically, it's constructed, you know, it's constructed by the interaction of the world around it, um, to the sense of being one with the greater self, with the capital S, the general consciousness. And so, to me, it's only logical that if someone is is actually on that journey and more plugged into the, the greater self, then in a way service is a natural thing because mm. by, by, ser- by general, general serving and trying to make a difference for everyone, we are, uh, as we are everyone anyway, <laughs> it's, only, it's actually, it's part of the process. Yeah. If that makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, if you stop thinking about yourself, you start to think about others. And, because on uh, a different level, we are others, we are others anyway. Mm-hmm. That's the point. Mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. We are just part of everything, so it's just logical that we would want to actually 
you know, working the, on the benefit for everything because that's 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 who we more deeply are anyway. Yeah, uh, yeah, I, I agree. I absolutely agree. I think this is part of it. I think it's interesting how different traditions encapsulate that. Like the Bhagavad Gita talks about that as a, your duty, your dharma for society, and um, the Kala Chakra Tantra that you were talking about, Samir. That certainly incorporates this idea of bringing heaven to earth from Shambhala <laughs> to earth. Yeah. That's that's um I suppose the question is how how do we do that in our education systems how do we do that in our healthcare? how do we do that in our housing you know that's or food all of that I think it plays a really important part of spirituality or, or as well kundalini awakenings because creating that safe environment for humans ultimately will support a healthy awakening or easy easy easeful awakening more easeful and vice versa You're right more awakenings will actually create the best environment for every for everyone right right absolutely well but thank you Anne. i think um this has been a really interesting podcast and it'd be great to do some more so we can split this into two um it seems like we've spoken about the individual journey with switch awakening kundalini and what would be great is to do a second part where we can speak about some of the things you touched upon, um, the more societal uh, repercussions of Kundalini awakening and the collective drive of awakening experiences and, and where uh, spiritual awakening places us within the, in the collective. So um, I want to say thank you and I look forward to the next part two podcast. Thank you for having me. It's been so much fun chatting with you guys and hearing your ideas. It's uh... Yeah, I, I love the mission that you're on with sharing this concept. <laughs> yeah, thank it's you. Been, and, and thanks, Dave. Oh, it's been a pleasure. It's been an absolute pleasure. Yeah, really looking forward to uh, more discussions about this topic for sure.